the challenge to perfect fly steer judging so it will be more closely related with production efficiency and actual carcass value is greater now than ever before in the history of the beef cattle industry. Muscling, as it is indicated by a steer's conformation, and finish, which refers to the degree of fat and how it is distributed, are the two major factors to consider in judging slaughter steers. In addition, we consider dressing percentage and also those factors considered important in selecting breeding cattle such as quality indications, set of feet and legs, weight, and age. A muscular, correctly finished steer may yield a carcass worth $50 more than an overfinished, poorly muscled steer of the same weight and grade, or a poorly muscled, underfinished steer of a lower grade. Our problem then is to select and produce efficient, muster cattle that will yield high quality beef with little excess fat. This kind presently exists in all our beef cattle breeds. Now let's look at three different kinds of steers that demonstrate differences in muscling and finish. We look at these on the chart. One, a muscular, correctly finished steer that is very desirable. Two, a steer of only average muscling that is definitely overfinished and will yield a carcass of much excess fat and is less desirable than number one. And number three, a poorly muscled steer that is definitely underfinished and we expect it to yield poor quality beef. We will now look at three steers that have been selected to illustrate these points. These steers are numbered in the same order as the illustrations on our chart from left to right. One on the left, two in the middle, and three on the right. We will now go back to the chart and look at the front views on the chart which illustrate the differences in finish and muscling. The differences in muscling are illustrated mainly by the width between the front legs and the overall thickness through the shoulder. You notice that one has the most width between his legs and the thickness through the shoulder as compared to either two or three. The differences in finish are indicated by the fullness and plumpness through the brisket. Number one, has some fullness through his brisket, yet not the excessive deep overfinished brisket as shown in number two. And number three is definitely deficient in the brisket and also a steer that's rather narrow throughout, indicating a lack of muscle. Let's now look at these three steers and see that they illustrate these points. You notice that number one is a heavy bone steer. And we know that the development of bone is related to muscling. This steer is very thick and muscular through the shoulder and shows good width between his front legs and some plumpness through his brisket, yet not excessively fat through his brisket. Two, a steer that's definitely excessively fat and full through his brisket, a steer that's not as heavy bone as number one and also doesn't show the width between his front legs or the width through his shoulders, which indicate muscle. Number three, the lightest bone steer of the three that lacks fullness through his brisket and overall width and thickness through his shoulders, which indicate muscle. We'll now go back to the chart and look at the three side views on our chart. One is moderate in depth of body and length of body. A very muscular, well-balanced steer that is correctly finished. A steer that's especially long in his rump. Has a lot of muscling in his arm and his forearm and a lot of width through his stifle. Two, a steer that's excessively deep-bodied, especially wasty in his brisket, in his plate and his rear flank. A steer that lacks the length of rump and the indication of muscling that we had in number one. This steer is also too short-legged and too short-bodied. Number three, a rather long-legged steer that is cut up on his flanks and long-bodied and lacks the indication of muscling and enough finish to get in the choice grade. We'll now look at the three side views of these steers which illustrate these points. One, a steer that's moderate in depth of body and length of body. A steer that's very well balanced. A steer that's got a lot of length in his rump from his hook to his pin. He's got a lot of width through his stifle and a lot of bulge and thickness here through his stifle. He's also muscular in his arm and his forearm. And a steer that's fairly trim through his middle which would indicate a high dressing finish. On number two, this steer is excessively heavy and full through his middle which would lower his dressing percentage. He's also excessively deep bodied. 
been especially deep and wasty through his brisket, through his plate, and through his rear flank, which would cut down on his cutout and his carcass. This deer also likes the length of rump as shown on number one, and he indicates the muscling in his stifle, and his arm, and his forearm. This deer is too short-bodied and too short-legged. Number three, a rather long-legged steer that's light of bone. He's also a rather long-bodied steer that's cut up in his flank and likes the indications of muscling through his stifle and his arm and his forearm. And the all, overall indication of finish to indicate that he would be a choice grade steer. We'll now go back to the chart and look at the rear views. On our muscular correctly finished deer, we see that the widest part of the body on this deer is through the mid part of his round. This deer is also very correctly shaped and turned up over his top. He's got a lot of width between his hind legs and he's fairly clean up in the area of his twist. Number two, a steer that's rather flat up over his top. He tapers from his rump down to his twist. A steer that's very heavy middle and does not have the desired width between his hind legs. A very excessively deep bodied wasty kind of steer. Three, a steer that's rather long legged rather narrow through his round, rather house top up over his top, and rather narrow in this area. So we'll now look at the rear view of our three steers. I think it's evident that number one is very wide through his round. This is the thickest part of the body on this steer. The steer is very thick through his crop, over his loin, and correctly turned up over his top. A steer with good width between his hind legs, which indicates muscling, and also the overall balance and thickness of the steer. Number two, a steer that's rather narrow on his hind legs. He's a steer that's got patches of fat, excess fat around his tail head. A steer that is pretty wide over his top, but a lot of this width is due to excess fat along his loin edges and along his rump. And a steer that does not have the bone or the indication of muscle we had in number one. Number three, a steer that's also relatively narrow between his hind legs. He's narrow through his round, which indicates the desired muscling. A steer that's rather narrow over his top, rather prominent in his tail head, and likes the indication of desired finish. We will now watch these three steers walk away from us and see how wide they walk behind and how well they show up as far as their muscling is concerned. You'll note that number one walks with the maximum width between his hind legs of any of the three steers. The steer is very thick and muscular through his round and very correctly turned up over his top. As these steers turn around and come to us, I think the points that we've been making as far as the indications of correct finish and over finished and also the indication of muscling are evident. This number three steer, a rather long-legged, plain, unbalanced kind of steer that we would expect to be uh, rather uh, poor in muscling. Number two, the excessively heavy, wasty fat steer, steer that's undesirable from that standpoint. And then number one, our correctly finished muscular steer that we think is very desirable and the desired type. I think as these steers stop and we see them from the side view, that these points are very evident. It's evident that number one, is the most desirable, number two less desirable, and number three an undesirable type of steer. Now let's go back and see what kind of carcasses we expect these steers to yield. We have here a cross section of the carcass at the 12th rib showing the big rib eye that we'd expect to find in number one. We'd expect this steer to have a rib eye of about 12 square inches with approximately six to seven tenths inches of fat covering over this rib eye. As compared to number two with a 10 inch rib eye, with over an inch of fat covering over this rib eye, which would yield excessive fat trim in the carcass. Number three, a relatively small rib eye of only about eight square inches and around four tenths inches of fat covering up over the rib eye. We would expect uh, number one and number two to yield carcasses of choice quality, whereas number three, only good or standard grade quality. We expect number one to yield 48% of his carcass weight in the boneless steak and roast cut. Number two, about 42%, and number three, about 48% also. We will now slaughter these steers at our meat laboratory, and next we will look at the right intact side, plus the rib steak of these steers, and the important carcass information. We are now focused on the right intact side and the important carcass information from the steers we observed live. The left sides were cut into the various cuts and into the lean, fat, and bone trim. A untrimmed rib steak was retained to show the area of rib eye and the fat thickness. The fat trim from the left side is displayed beneath its respective side. We will note that number one is a very thick muscular carcass with prime conformation, with very thick plump muscling through the round, 
through the loin, through the rib, and the chuck area. This carcass yielded 13.5% of its carcass weight in fat trim. Number two is a relatively thick carcass of average muscling. However, it definitely displays excess fat over the rump, along the loin edge, and over the air of the rib. This carcass had excess fat trim of 20 and 3 tenths percent of its carcass weight. Number three, a carcass that is rather narrow compared to either one or two, with a rather relatively long shank, narrow round, and relatively narrow through the loin and through the rib area. This carcass has only good conformation and the least amount of fat of any of the three carcasses. It yielded only 11 and 4 tenths percent of its carcass weight in fat trim. Now let's go to the chart, and you'll notice these untrimmed rib stakes. This large muscle is the ribeye muscle that we have referred to, and this is the fat thickness covering over the ribeye at the 12th rib. Ribeye area is an easily obtained measure of muscling in the carcass. However, it is not highly related with total lean in the carcass. You'll note that number one had a very large ribeye of 12 square inches, a very large muscular ribeye. Number two was only average in muscling, with nine and six tenths inches of ribeye area. Number three, the least muscular rib, eight and seven tenths square inches of ribeye area. Notice this is a rather narrow ribeye that lacks plumpness. Fat thickness is another easily obtained measure on the carcass, and it's fairly highly related to total fat trim from the carcass. We'll note that number one had three quarters of an inch of fat thickness over the ribeye at the 12th rib. This is about the maximum amount of fat desired on choice and prime grade cattle. Number two was definitely over fat with one and three tenths inches of fat thickness over the ribeye. I think this is very noticeable here, a very thick, heavy covering of fat which yielded excess fat trim, which we have just demonstrated. Number three, although it was adequately covered with fat, had only 4,500 inch of fat covering, and this is not usually enough fat to get into the choice grade. USDA quality grade is based on degree of marbling, on the color, firmness, and texture of the meat. Number one and two, both graded choice, with about the same color and degree of marbling in the meat and with the conformation of the carcass and the maturity. Number three, graded only U.S. good due to the lack of quality indications in the meat and the good grade conformation of its carcass. The boneless, closely trimmed roast and steak cuts at the center of the carcass, these cuts come from the loin, rib, round, rump, and chuck and are the most valuable part of the carcass. These are the areas which we emphasize in live evaluation of cattle. Number one yielded 51% of its carcass weight in these muscular high price cuts due to the fact that it was muscular and correctly finished. Number two dropped down to 45 and 8 tenths percent due to the fact that this carcass was only average in muscling. That is, he had about one square inch of ribeye area for 100 weight alive and due to the excess fat on this carcass. Number three yielded 49 and 9 tenths percent and out yielded number two primarily because it had only about half as much fat trim. And this demonstrates the influence of fatness on cutout, which is about three times as great as the influence of muscling. The carcass value up 100 weight based on cutout and grade. This is the actual value based on current prices to the packer of these carcasses. Number one was valued at $39.50 due to its choice grade and the high percent of the high price cut. Number two was valued at $36.35 due to the fact that it was less muscular and had much more fat trim, which is valued at only a nickel a pound as compared to less fat trim in number one. Number three was valued at $36.75 which is about equal to the value of number two, even though number three was figured on good grade prices. This shows the influence of excess fat on carcass value. The 
beef cattle producers are definitely more interested in live value of steers. Let us now go back over to our chart and see the live value of these steers. Number one, the live value, $25.72 per hundred pounds. Number two, $23.06 per hundred pounds alive. Number three, $22.23. Dressing, dressing percentage enters into the live value of cattle. Number one had a dressing percentage of 65%, and due to its high carcass value, plus a high dressing percentage, was worth $25.72, which is about $3 per hundred weight more than the other two. Number two was valued at $23.06 alive. It was worth more than number three due to the fact that it had about 3% higher dressing percentage. I think it is evident that the carcass from number one was valued at about $20 higher than either the carcass of number two or number three. Beef cattle producers should keep a breath of the carcass desirability of their cattle. This service is now available, and for more information on this, you should contact your local county agricultural agent. We have looked at three different kinds of steers, which illustrated differences in muscling and finish, which are the two major factors we should consider in evaluating steers. I think it is now more evident that we need to produce cattle that have the attributes of number one, which will in turn increase production efficiency and increase and standardize both the quality and quantity of beef produced and will contribute to our all over beef cattle industry. 